So are there any platforms online or places where people can get a better understanding, any resources that can help people understand the risks and benefits? Probably the best place to start in terms of reliable information would be those nonprofit organizations. So National MS Society here in the US and similar yes. um, organizations around the world. I think what I learned, one of the findings from my first study was that reliability of information is highly variable. Mm. Um, there are a lot of uh, personal um, personal analogies, um, personal experiences. So just a single person and, and the journey that they've been through. And it's great that people are sharing the journey that they've been through. Of course it is. But that's why we have rigorous research because we can't base our recommendations on the findings of one person. Mm. There has to be a large body of evidence before we make recommendations to everybody. I think that comes through through a lot of online groups in MS, which is fantastic because yep. social networking is so important and Support. to speak with like-minded people as well um, is, a, is a huge benefit for those people in community. And in a few of those groups, people love sharing experience. And I think when it comes to things, again, that is modifiable or things that people can take into their hands. Um, talking about diet is a, such a hot topic. And like Karen mentioned, anecdotes, personal experiences can really sometimes overshadow the evidence base. So if someone has a positive experience with a dietary pattern or with a way of eating, that might not be relevant for someone else. Everyone's needs are so different. Nutrition is not a one size fits all, just like how an exercise physiologist might prescribe an exercise program that would be different from one person to another. So I think leading people to the evidence base is a huge part of our role um, and that like Karen said National MS Society in Australia we've got the MS Australia um, website we've actually just now launched yesterday on World MS Day um, a modifiable lifestyle guidelines document and that was a group of probably 50, 50 plus yeah. content okay. experts in all different areas of research. So we both contributed to the dietary chapter, comorbidities, stress, smoking, all of these things that go hand in hand with diet. Mm -hmm. And so directing people to something like Karen said, nonprofit evident or nonprofit organizations that showcase this evidence is probably the best place to start. And of course, they will recommend that people follow dietary guidelines. We have to acknowledge there's resistance against dietary guidelines. Unfortunately, science is not as exciting. <clears throat> science is not as exciting as the way that influencers deliver information about nutrition mm -hmm. and diet. So sometimes science is boring, but it's underpinned by evidence and we can't ignore that. So when it comes to dietary guidelines, there's a link between dietary guidelines, metabolic comorbidities and outcomes in MS that's becoming a very strong link in the research. And that link is if a person with MS is obese or if they have diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, so those metabolic risk factors, there's increasing evidence to show that their MS outcomes can actually be much poorer as well. So that's how following dietary guidelines, which directly address those metabolic comorbidities, can be helpful to someone living with MS. And that's one of the points that I really tried to make yesterday in my presentation. And Olivia followed that up with a wonderful case study. It's probably a good idea to talk about that. Yeah, I think on, on the background of what Karen's talking about with regards to obesity and metabolic comorbidities, what is it, day three of the conference? Mm. And I think in every session so far that has come up from neurologists, EPs, nurses, consumers in their conversations as well, yep. It's a really prominent theme and flavor of the conference, but what's missing from that conversation is that diet and exercise are first-line therapy for managing obesity and managing metabolic comorbidities. And I think is the role of dietitians, obviously we advocate for that. Um, a lot of people may need to get their medical support or pharmacologic benefit if we find diet and exercise is not enough. But linking that back and trying to advocate for that last message to be in the conversation is a huge part of our work and something we're really passionate about. So 
as part of that clinical course yesterday, um, bringing to life Karen's research and the role of diet and dietitians in MS care, I then approached the conversation through a clinical perspective. So I am a researcher as well in MS, but I also work clinically in my caseload as people living with MS. So I think I get the dual benefit of seeing research and celebrating success with patients while contributing to the evidence base, which is extremely rewarding. And the two cases I presented yesterday is completely marries up with what Karen's research is showing as well. So the first case um, that I unpacked was a man presenting. So he has MS, living with MS, relapsing, remitting MS, diagnosed in 2016, which it, it, he's being treated with Ocrifus every six months. On presentation, he was largely overweight. So technically, according to World Health Organization, he was obese class two. And on presentation, he had a pathology report that showed a long-standing history with dyslipidemia. So a red flag for me is that this hypertension, this high, high cholesterol and elevated LDL cholesterol was being untreated for quite a number of years. <laughs> Key signs of metabolic syndrome, but an incomplete pathology report as well. So as part as, of part of my role is then advocating with his medical team to get more tests done. And that included um, following up glucose, for example, and seeing is there risk of diabetes. And that actually came back that showed he had longstanding type 2 diabetes and that had never been mentioned to him before. So as part of my role in that, with my then clinical hat on, knowing first line treatment is managing diet and exercise mm. to support metabolic comorbidities, supporting that patient to achieve a healthy weight. We, or I worked with him for, well, still working with him, it's been 16 months and we don't really use the term that diabetes has been reversed, but his average glucose marker, so HbA1c, what we refer to in Australia, the cutoff for diabetes is 6.5%. When this patient presented, his HbA1c was 8.4 and his last report, now it's come down to 6.4. So technically, while we don't give the false hope that this has been reversed, we can encourage this, this patient that his metabolic markers are extremely well managed. And like Karen said, the evidence we just cannot ignore when with respect to lifestyle comorbidities and MS outcomes. So thinking things like disease progression, dis uh, disability progression, rates of hospitalization, ambulatory disability, um, symptom burden and severity, and all of those things that are encompassing what people well manage with MS, if we can help to improve that from a dietary perspective is what, absolutely key. 